Hi, and welcome to Talking Tech. I'm your host, Alejandro Ojos, and today we're gonna to be taking a close look at Lunar Lake P course. Today with us, helping us on this, is Ori. Hey, Ori, how's it going today? Hey, Alex, how are you? Doing great. So, uh, for those who are joining us today, why don't you tell us uh, what do you do at Intel and what's your title? So, I work on Intel Speed Course. Okay. And I'm a senior principal engineer in the core design team. Do a little microarchitecture, a little design. Um, that's basically it. Okay, nice. So uh, for Lunar Lake, you work on the P cores, which are the performance cores. When Lunar Lake was defined, uh, what were the major goals that you were looking at when uh, trying to find the, the P core and the new P core architecture for, for this? So uh, we started working on Lion Cove actually before uh, Lunar Lake was defined. Mm -hmm. And the Lion Cove trajectory was significantly different than what it ended up being. Um, Lunar Lake was sort of a new platform aiming for super low power and super efficient compute. And the Lunar Lake architects basically asked us to design a P-Core version that would be significantly more PNP oriented, um, give peak SD performance, but at a much better um, power envelope. And so we really had to take a close look at the core <clears throat> and see how we could optimize it for that specific use. So, you, so we're looking at uh, the improved uh, the PNP means power and, and performance. Power to yeah, power to performance ratio. Power to performance, or performance ratio. at power. Exactly. Okay, so performance and power for the for a single <clears throat> for a single thread for usage single thread because usage. that's uh, again we have a hybrid system. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that the Equors uh, present a much more efficient and performant multi-thread acceleration vehicle. So what you need the P cores for is your um, responsiveness, user-facing tasks. And that means single thread workloads. So usually P cores are hyper threaded, but for, yep. for, for Lunar Lake, that has changed. Yep. Okay, can you walk us through, like, I guess, the history of, of hyper threading and why we have to make that change uh, for, for Lunar Lake? Yeah, so remember um, 20 years ago, some of us are old enough to remember, um, our SOCs, calling them SOCs is kind of funny, had a single core. Okay, um, and so adding a second concurrent thread to run on that physical core was really um, uh, groundbreaking because you had two contexts being run instead of one. Uh, so you, you, they didn't have to context switch all the time without doubling the hardware. Um, now as things progressed, uh, core counts grew, but the OS could still take advantage of, of, uh, of scheduling many threads on, on the um, SOC. Hyper-threading made, made sense because it increased overall compute throughput. But hybrid kind of changed all that because again, it provided an alternative for multi-thread acceleration with the E-cores. And so we have these two cores. One is really optimized for throughput because it's so efficient. And the other should really run the tasks that really require the performance. And you don't really want a sibling thread to sit on that core impeding that user-facing thread. So um, again, when we, we had to um, improve the PNP characteristics of the core, we took a look at hyper-threading and started measuring its value versus its cost because it doesn't come for free, right? You need to replicate state. You need to put arbitration points along the pipeline. You need fairness mechanisms. You need security hardware. This, these things cost transistors in area and CDIME. And if the product doesn't really uh, want that capability because it can't utilize it under the power budget or it's detrimental to overall performance, um, the question was, what do we really gain by taking it out? And it turns out we gain quite a lot. Uh, it improves you know, our, the PNP characteristic of a single thread running of the core quite significantly, and you get it in a smaller area, smaller footprint. So that reduces cost. Uh, improves efficiency, and it's a win-win for everybody. Yeah, specifically for Lunar Lake, because we're looking about, uh, you know, this power budgets and the, definitely power and also size. It yeah. helps that to reduce and all that. Uh, so there also, I mean, you do hyper turn away, but that doesn't mean that we, there was kind of a, a loss on the performance, right? Because there were some, a lot of changes done at a microarchitecture level. Can we touch on some of those changes that we did the microarchitecture level to increase the, the performance, the IPCs? Yeah, first of all, taking hyper-threading away, it, 
when you talk about performance, you need to um, put the right context of power, okay? So there are certain platforms that um, hyper-threading doesn't really help you because you're so power constrained that adding that second thread doesn't increase your overall throughput. So we didn't really pay much for this on the product or the SOC level. Um, regarding your question, yes, we put a lot of emphasis on, on microarchitecture and line cove, not just to increase IPC for this particular core iteration, but also to remove some fundamental roadblocks um, and pave the way for future scaling. So I think that you know, line cove is unique in the sense that every core cluster or subsystem um, did a very fundamental change in order to um, you know, open up the scalability further. So if we're talking about the front end part of the core that is responsible for fetching instructions and decoding them, um, we've redone our uh, branch prediction scheme to significantly widen our prediction block. And that helps both pre-fetching instructions into our instruction cache alleviating misses. And also it allows us to widen the fetch block from which we generate the actual instructions feeding into the out-of-order part of the machine. On the out-of-order side, we um, broke the, the glass ceiling of monolithic sc um, scheduling mm -hmm. by splitting the out-of-order engine into an integer and a vector domain. Oh, wow. And this way, each domain can scale independently of the other, giving more headroom for growth. And it also provides a nice power opportunity because you know, workloads that predominantly use one of the domains can power down the other. And my favorite, is the uh, uh, memory subsystem, which went through a huge overhaul. Um, and, and it's kind of funny because caches, you know, you want them big, but you also want them fast. So it's, a, it's, a, it's like a balancing act. Mm -hmm. And I think that on Line Cove, we um, both decreased um, our overall memory latency or load to use latency, which is great for IPC. At the same time, we've increased our capacity, okay, bigger L2, a nice intermediate L1 uh, cache, and also increased our capacity to consume external bandwidth. This architectural overhaul uh, gave us a, a win on all fronts, which is kind of unique. Let me take you back to, to the front end. When you increase the fetch, because we made it so much bigger, wider, does that also helps you, I guess, because you were able to load all that on, on power or? Um, no, it's not a power play. I think that the element in our front end um, subsystem that, that is beneficial for power is our UOP cache, okay? Um, our UOP cache provides a means of reusing um, decoded um, instructions um, because again, our, our code is, is temporal, so there's a lot of reuse. And we can reuse UOPs out of the UOP cache without powering up the fetch and decode pipeline. So increasing the UOP cache and allowing it to, uh, increasing its bandwidth towards the out-of-order um, um, part of the machine helps you with, uh, with energy per instruction or CDINE and that it allows you to power down the, uh, the fetch and decode pipelines. There's also a couple of things that caught my attention that were implemented here. One of them was the granularity of the clock. Yeah, that change was all about um, allowing the core to really consume all the power budget that it's given by the SOC. Um, so our traditional clock granularity is 100 megahertz, right? That's the, the, the so-called bin that everybody's talking about. But you know, these discrete 100 megahertz intervals sometimes uh, leave you in no man's land, meaning the, core, the SOC budgets you for, say, 3.08 gigahertz but you can't reach that. You're stuck at three gigahertz because you can't satisfy the jump to 3.1 gig. So that 16 megahertz interval allows you to close the gap and increase your performance by that gap which you close. So if you clock at 3.067, that gives you another 2%, which you couldn't have had if you stayed with the uh, coarse granularity. Oh, that's nice, you know, a better control of the power budget. Yep. And, yep. Uh, the other thing was that was pretty interesting was, uh, uh, the thermal controls that you have in there uh, that are somewhat uh, AI control based. Yeah, uh, the magic of AI. So yeah, I think that, that we're unique in that sense as well as we have this microcontroller inside the core that does all this uh, machine learning magic behind the, behind the scenes. And you need to understand that traditionally um, the thermal management control loop had to be tuned 
um, to cater to all extreme scenarios. And this tuning was, was done statically and were do, was done in our labs pre-launch. And it had to cater to all possible scenarios. Now, when you need to really be safe under all conditions, um, it means you're leaving performance on the table because not all of the conditions are that extreme, right? right? So if you had a means by which to measure what's going on right now, I mean, which workload is being run? Um, how much does it heat the hardware? What is the platform thermal solution? What is the ambient temperature? I mean, running on the North Pole is different than running here in Taipei. And then adapt on the fly and set temporal thresholds for thermal management based on the, the actual temporal conditions, you could have much tighter temperature convergence, which allow you to increase your frequency and sustain your performance for longer. Um, and, that's, and that's what we did online. Oh my God. Uh, so some some good changes in there. It's pretty interesting because yeah, like you said, they, there's out of the lab they build some guard bands and you're leaving some yep. performance on, on on the table. And they get in your way most of the time. Yep. So there is a change that uh, caught my attention because as a former analog design engineer, uh, we made a change that we went from latches to flops. When, uh, yep. uh, what was the reason behind that that change? Okay. So first of all, um, you know. Going to flop saves your C dime, right? Because it cuts your sequentials by half. Instead mm -hmm. of two latches, you get one flop. And it cuts your clock distribution significantly. And a lot of your power, or C dime, is spent on clock distribution. So the more flop dominated you are, the less power you spend on distributing clocks everywhere. So that part um, is, is kind of intuitive. The second part is it's kind of an enabler to go to big partitions, OK? If you want to synthesize one million cells, the, the complexity, the memory footprint of, of uh, holding these partitions, converging them, running timing, optimizing them, um, with latches, it grows exponentially because you have transparencies and you need to deal with multi-cycle paths uh, or paths spending, spanning multiple cycles. And with flops, it's pretty standard. And that's what the entire industry does. So it's kind of a requirement to go to industry standard tools that you have industry standard design. So you win on PNP because of the CDN reduction and it basically enables you to do this transition to, um, to big partitions or large uh, base synthesis, which kind of requires you to go to thought-based design. All right, so now let's talk a little bit about the changes that have been done when it comes to layouts, all the improvements about layout. So I know there has been some changes down there. Okay, tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, so the, the P-Core design methodology was kind of archaic in the sense that we still uh, partitioned the work into small building blocks, which we call FUBs, okay, mm -hmm. which contained you know, tens of thousands of cells. Um, some of them were uh, manually drawn, right? Um, because we had this uh, uh, methodology of drawing out circuits, um, uh, data path FUBs. Um, and the industry went, really went forward and moved to a synthesis-based design. And on Langtov, we, we did that shift. Um, and we went big, going from these small FUBs to big partitions of hundreds of thousands to millions of cells. Um, and we really worked closely with, with uh, industry-leading vendors and partners that, that adapted their, their tools and flows to our unique needs. It sounds not as sexy as architecture or microarchitecture, but it, it really is um, at the heart of the core's innovation, and it, it helps in several respects. One is that the removal of artificial physical boundaries in the design, if you build big blocks instead of small blocks, um, dr drastically increases your area efficiency. That means lower overall size, decreased cost, um, just it delivers a better IP. Uh, the other part of it is that the integration overhead is greatly decreases, right? Because you need to integrate six or seven boxes instead of 300, okay? Which means your hardening time gets shorter, and that means that you can pack more content e into each core iteration, okay? That accelerates the pace of innovation, means that we can make um, more, we can spend more, more of our time actually adding IPC and, and features and less time implementing them in the back end. And third, this uh, allows for easier spin-offs of SOC-specific uh, derivatives out of the mainline core IP um, that you can productize very, very fast and build better products with. 
Uh, Lion Cove actually proves this because the Lion Cove version goes into Lunar Lake and Arrow Lake later this year is different in, in several aspects. But looking forward, I mean, we're going to um, leverage that into building, um, I wouldn't say custom build, but customizable uh, cores into different SOCs catering to their, to their needs. So this change um, really allows us to uh, proliferate faster and better cater to our uh, customers. Yeah, so it gives you some scalability and you know f faster turnaround time, which is, yep. is great. Mm -hmm. Ori, thank you so much. I learned a lot. Appreciate it. You bet. This is great. Mm -hmm.